right, hi everybody, it's Michael Shermer. We're here in the offices of the Skeptic Society and Skeptic Magazine. I just want to ask you to give your support to us. We are a 501c3 nonprofit science education organization. We promote science as opposed to junk science, voodoo science, pathological science, bad science, non-science, and plain old nonsense. And unless you've been abducted by aliens or sent by Elon Musk to Mars for the last 30 years, you know there's a lot of nonsense out there. Some people call us debunkers, but you know what? There's a lot of bunk that needs debunking. That's part of our job, as well as explaining and understanding why people believe in bunk. And so if you want to support our efforts, go to skeptic.com slash donate. Skeptic.com slash donate. Your tax-deductible donation will support our work here at the Skeptic Society. Nick, thanks for coming on. It's a great honor to speak to you. I don't think we've ever met in person, but I'm a long-time fan so. of your work. And uh, you've really sparked a, a, an international conversation. Yeah, with the whole AI thing, yeah. Um, now it's been fascinating in the years since Superintelligence came out in 2014, just how much has changed. Um, what used to be a, a very fringe topic. I mean, back then, uh, at least in academia, the whole idea that AIs could potentially achieve general intelligence someday and maybe super intelligence and that that could pose various kinds of risks like was uh, like dismissed as science fiction or futurism and there were like in the world in total maybe like a handful of people scattered around the internet trying to work on on the ai alignment problem and, and now of course all the frontier ai labs have research groups working on this and you have statements coming out of the white house and other places focusing on transformative ai so yeah it's been a Interesting journey. Indeed. Uh, let me start off with a statement from your colleague, Eliezer Yudkowsky. You'll be familiar with this. After ChatGPT came out, he published an op-ed in, in Time magazine. Uh, this actually, oh my God, it's one year ago today he published this. <laughs> That's amazing. Many researchers steeped in these issues, including myself, expect that the most likely result of building a superhumanly smart AI under anything remotely like the current circumstances is that literally everyone on earth will die. Not as in maybe possibly some remote chance, but as in this is the obvious thing that would happen. <laughs> what do you think about that extreme statement? Well, I mean, so there's a spectrum of uh, people with different P dooms, as it's known colloquially, the probability of doom from AI, where, where he's at one, towards one end of that, like amongst, like, perhaps the most pessimistic or certainly amongst them, among, uh, uh, amongst a set of people who actually have some knowledge and have thought about this and, and then others have lower probabilities. But um, I certainly think uh, there is a real chance, a real existential risk that will um, be connected to this transition to the machine superintelligence era. Um, and it's non-trivial and we should work to reduce it by putting in the effort to do develop scalable methods for AI control in whatever uh, time we have available before this happens. Um, and there is now more talent and resources going into that. So that's, that's the good news. Um, but I still think we don't yet fully have that problem uh, solved. So your institute's The Future of Humanity, the other one, The Future of Life, issued that statement a year ago now, um, calling for a pause on AI development. I noticed you didn't sign it. Why is that? Well, I'm not a big signer of things in general. Yeah. I just, the whole with isms and signing and it's just my personality. I'm, I'm, I feel there's also a little bit of a risk if you're, if you're, if you're a philosopher, if your kind of your job is to try to be a little detached and to evaluate things and be open-minded. Like once you start to get involved in a particular campaign, it's very hard to retain the ability to change your mind. It's not impossible, but it gets harder. And I feel philosophy is hard enough as it is without adding extra difficulties. I have no objection to other people. I think it's good people should be involved in, in campaigns and working for things. It's just, I always feel a little awkward. Also, usually any one given statement, there is always something that I slightly would have a different view or have worded differently. And so yeah, it's, it's more just my hang up rather than some kind of big statement I'm trying to make by not signing the statement. <laughs> right. The only statements I sign are that there should be no signed statements. We should <laughs> let people just say whatever they want. <laughs> Free speech. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. Okay. So just give us a little bit of background. You're so famous in this area. How did you get interested in AI? I mean, are you like a Star Trek fan or, you know, go, go back to your childhood or whatever 
uh, teen years or whatever triggered you to go down this pathway? Um, yeah, no, I'm, I'm actually not so much a science fiction type of reader. I mean, a lot of my friends and colleagues are. Uh, I just never really been much into that. Um, no, I had a, I mean, I grew up in Sweden, uh, and this was before the internet uh, in, in a relatively small town. And uh, I knew nobody uh, when I grew up who was at all interested in literature or science or ideas or anything like that. So I was like bored out of my mind in school. And uh, um, I, I associated sort of learning with school. So I didn't. Uh, and then I sort of went to the local library. I think I was 15, uh, randomly one afternoon and started pulling out one book and another. And I realized that like that was actually a big world of ideas, very different from the stuff that was covered in school. Uh, that was like super fascinating. and. Uh, and then I uh, pivoted and became kind of fanatically um, uh, engaged in this project of self-education because I, I felt I had been missing out, like I've wasted 15 years of my life and I wanted to make up. And then I started to study. I studied physics and AI and neuroscience and uh, I painted and wrote poetry and philosophy, of course, uh, and just everything I could sort of lay my hands on. Um, and uh, for as almost as long as I remember, it always seemed to me that um, there's a bunch of things we can do to change the world that consists basically of moving things around in the external world. Um, but what would be more likely to cause a profound change would be if one changed the thing that does the changing. And so all of the technologies and ideas that we have ultimately come through as sort of the birth canal of the human brain. So anything, if you could sort of upgrade the human brain or change our mood or, or uh, cognitive capacities, that that would be potentially transformative. And in parallel with that, if you could develop new brains through artificial intelligence research, that also could be world changing. So I had this vague sense from early on, and then I kind of, yeah, it got more specific as I went along. Neural networks, intriguingly, like actually from the very beginning, seemed to me like to have legs in the sense of being on the right path. And I remember, I think I was like 17 and I had gotten this like on interlibrary loan from the local library. There's this volume on parallel distributed processing, which was like one of the first sort of um, by Rommel Hart and like this, this classic now, but like where they tried to deconstruct uh, biological uh, neural circuits in, in mathematical terms. And I was like super fascinated about that. Um, and so, yeah, and then... Uh, um, I studied computational neuroscience in, uh, later on in, in London, and, uh, uh, and now, now this whole deep learning revolution seems, seems to validate this sense that these kind of massively distributed pattern recognizing of learning algorithms is the, the way to go. Yeah. Yeah, you know, somebody like me who I don't work in this area, you know, there's so many great smart experts on all sides of this, you know, you have Elon Musk and Stephen Hawking and Bill Gates concerned about AI existential risk. And then you have other people like Kevin Kelly or Steven Pinker going, no, 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 this is not going to happen. We can, we can do this incrementally. And so, uh, and I always think of you as sort of in the middle, <laughs> maybe, you know, your super intelligence book, uh, introduced the idea of the, you know, paperclip maximizer and the alignment problem. Uh, but I didn't feel you went to the extreme, position of, of a existential risk, but maybe give us a little bit of, of where you are now since that was 2014, right? Superintelligence, where yeah. you stand on, on the threats of this based on that alignment problem. Um, yeah, I think it is going to be a very powerful thing if we do create machine superintelligence. It's not just internet 3.0 or a mobile internet or like one of these, like always some new cool thing, right? But I think this is qualitatively different in that it will be the last invention we ever need to make mm. if, if we do it, because then it would do the father inventing and presumably at digital speeds. Um, and so I think it will be a transformative and uh, with enormous upside, and, but, but also uh, potentially big downside if, if we fail to align it to human values. And there is now a lot of resources where people are trying to explain how creating very powerful optimization systems, unless you're able to sort of point them very precisely, uh, could, could result in disasters in, in various different ways. 
Um, so yeah, if we are lucky, we will solve that uh, problem by the time somebody figures out how to solve the problem of making AI stats smart. Um, and, and as I said earlier, there are lots of people working on that now, and in, including a lot of the smartest people I know are kind of going into this now AI alignment and uh, um, more resources are being spent by Frontier Labs as well um, mm. in terms of devoting I, yeah, I wonder research if retirement. one of the solutions would just be government regulation uh, like of any technology. So here's my example. I have a Tesla. So I, I'm here in Santa Barbara. And I want to go to LAX, take my flight. I push the little button. I go navigate oh. LAX. Now it knows to avoid the heavily trafficked LA freeway. So it takes me down side roads and so on. The moment it takes me up on a sidewalk to mow down <laughs> a bunch of uh, pedestrians in order to avoid some traffic, uh, you know, how long would it be before the Department of uh, Tra uh, Department of Transportation and Safety Board, you know, swooped down and shut down Elon's company to to prevent that from ever happening again? You know, like a New York minute. Maybe that's one solution. Well, uh, I mean, if it happens in small pieces and gradually like that, we might have the ability to observe things going wrong and then take corrective measures. And that's how we deal with most uh, new technologies and the problems they cause. Like we invent cars, we find that they sometimes crash. So we invent seat belts and traffic lights, etc. cetera. Um, I think there is a small subset of things that could go wrong that are in a different category. I call them existential risks. And, and these are where there is a risk uh, to the very survival of uh, Earth originating intelligent life. And these are risks, in other words, that would sort of put a permanent end to the human story, where, where we don't get the second try. And so these are harder to deal with because we've got to get them right on the first try. I think AI is one potential source of existential risk. And there might be a few, few other areas like synthetic biology uh, might be another area where we could get unlucky and discover that there is some relatively easy way to do something tremendously destructive. Um, and so, yeah, if one looks at AI in particular as a source of existential risk, there are a few different ways in which it could do that. Um, like, one thing to like what? recognize is that once you have something that is a hu even just human level, but even more so when you have super human levels of intelligence is that it would be able to anticipate our responses to it. So if it wanted to uh, mow a lot of people down, if you were like some sort of rogue self-driving car AI, right? It wouldn't just run over a few and then be surprised that uh, the Department of Transportation shot it down because that, that would be an obvious thing that would we, we can even realize that, right? So, and so it would make some smarter plan to achieve its goal of mowing people down. That might include things like deceiving us about its capabilities, uh, uh, in deceiving us about its goals and intentions. It would have convergent instrumental reason perhaps to seek more resources and intelligence while also convincing us that it is safe. And so this, this can make such systems harder to, to test because mm. they might behave very differently in the sort of deployment phase than in the testing phase. Um, and so, yeah, and if we think like, you know, you could make analogies to like when Homo sapiens arose on this planet and what happened to our Neanderthal brethren mm. at that point, or when uh, indeed uh, at a slightly lower level of intensity, but when a technologically more advanced uh, civilization has encountered a less technologically advanced uh, civilization, uh, which has happened, and often it doesn't end up very well for the less <laughs> technologically yes, advanced civilization. <laughs> so if you imagine that delta between sort of human cognitive and technological capacity and what the AI could do being very large, then we might have a kind of much bigger uh, encounter with, but where we now, like with our uh, like fancy Western advanced technology would be like the underdog and this would be like basically like an alien civilization coming from the future, but in the shape of a super intelligent AI that has kind of run ahead in. in. So, so that, that's one like type of scenario. There are other scenarios in which it might unfold more gradually and there might be many of these AIs and they are competitive. Um, and uh, there are dynamics in the economic competition between these different AI systems that might be hard to control. And if you insist on having too much human oversight and human in the loop, it might slow down your AI system and somebody else who, you know, have fewer scruples, their AI system will, you know, 
and then you know, out trade you on the stock market or out invent you in, in technology space and out maneuver you in military space. Like their drones just are autonomous and operate faster. And you have some guy who has to sit to press a button every time before it fires. Like if we're unlucky, the dynamic there could just be such that the winning strategy is just to basically allow the AIs to run at full speed and do whatever they want. And uh, it's not clear what, what would happen to the human species in the long term in that, uh, in that kind of scenario. So there are various different ways in which things could conceivably uh, go off the rails. Yeah, maybe. I was thinking about Yukoski's statement, all life on Earth. How, how would that happen? Well, the only thing I could think of was, because he didn't give any examples, but, uh, you know, like maybe AI creates a video, a deep fake video that's so convincing, showing Biden launching the nukes against Russia or vice versa, and then that uh, initiates a, a large-scale thermonuclear exchange, and that, that could end all life. That's the only thing I could think of that could end all life on Earth. Even there, well, probably I mean, not. Wouldn't have, like, a, a nuclear exchange wouldn't end all life. Uh, it probably wouldn't even end all human life right. uh, on the Southern Hemisphere. Um, I mean, it would, like, I, uh, I recommend against running that experiment. And <laughs> yes. we, we certainly know that it would be like the biggest horror ever. But, um, but there is still a distinction to be drawn, even if it's like academic, between a global catastrophic risk that, that could be very bad uh, and, and an existential risk, which would literally be the end. Of, of the human uh, experiment. Because there have been big setbacks, there have been dark ages and plagues and all kinds of stuff. At, at one point um, in our prehistory, it looks like there was a population bottleneck and we might have been down to a few thousand individuals. But eventually we came back from that. And similarly, if there is a nuclear war, but you know a bunch of coastal areas in the Southern hemisphere where they can do fishing or whatever, they survive and then you know, after a few hundred years, we might be back to where we started. Um, uh, but there are other ways uh, uh, available to uh, superintelligence, uh, like you could invent new biological constructions that would wipe us out, maybe, or nanotechnology, or, or maybe it just doesn't even bother very much with us, but just sort of starts to transform Earth into one giant data center or some sort of launch facility for. Uh, launching uh, space probes to kind of spread throughout and, and we sort of perish as a side effect of the waste heat uh, or something like that. Um, um, yeah, I think it would be wrong to anchor too much on any particular concrete scenario of the precise mechanism whereby uh, human life or human values uh, would, would be trampled over. Um, and and more, think more abstractly that if you have this very powerful strategizing force in the world that is antagonistic to us, chances are this much smarter, more strategic thing would eventually prevail and be able to do whatever it tries to do. Um, so so that, that, that's kind of like, yeah, a, a class of ways in which things could go wrong. Um, now, hopefully we will uh, uh, learn how not to do that, um, as I said. Uh, and then uh, we might end up in this condition of a solved world that I discussed in the book. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I want to get to the deep utopian, but I just want to give you a chance to respond to a couple of your critics of that. Stephen Pinker writes of these um, purported existential threats. They depend on the premises that, one, humans are so gifted that they can design an omniscient and omnipotent AI, yet so moronic that they would give it control of the universe without testing how it works. And two, the AI would be so brilliant that it could figure out how to transmute elements and rewire brains, yet so imbecilic that it would wreak havoc based on elementary blunders of misunderstanding. Yeah. Well, first of all, some elements there are just added for no reason, I guess, transmute elements. I don't particularly know why that would be a necessary component of the view that AI could pose risks. Um, but I think the basic idea that we could be smart enough to create this thing without being smart enough to realize that we also need to solve the control problem, unfortunately, seems like um, a realistic possibility uh, that we seem smart enough to create it. I mean, I mean, you can judge for yourself, but uh, year by year, we've seen AI capabilities galloping ahead. And I mean, it's an open question whether this current paradigm will take us there, but certainly it doesn't seem... A ridiculous view to think that it might. Um, 
and then that we might fail to realize that there could be a difficult control problem or, or that we could mistakenly convince ourselves that we've solved it even though our solution is flawed. Um, I think it's also pretty plausible and uh, more plausible because there would be strong incentives for people to do precisely that. If you have multiple labs or multiple countries all competing to develop this you know, potentially hugely lucrative uh, technology, right? And also strategically relevant for national security, et cetera. There's like this raising dynamic where multiple uh, groups race to get there first um, and whoever slows down or spends more of their efforts on, on safety and precautions and testing it, like they just fall behind. You could see that even in a good scenario where people realize that the, ideally we should do this carefully, like that, that would still be just like overwhelming and competitive pressures to, to make it happen as quickly as possible, even with fewer safeguards. Um, and, and I'm sure that as we move closer to this, to kind of polarized debates that we're already beginning to see will be amplified and, and who knows how that shakes out. Uh, people have kind of a tendency to run in herds. Um, and this, this holds on both sides of this AI debate. I mean, in fact, I have started to worry slightly about the possibility of overshooting the target in terms of AI alarm. Um, back in 2014, when the book came out, and I worked on it for six years before that, like the whole possibility of risks from transformative AI was completely neglected. So I thought they, they clearly there needed to be more attention to that than was given to it at the time, because at the time it was basically zero. So it's like now, on the other hand, uh, there is a lot more, and we are beginning to hear even top-level policymakers start saying negative things about AI. Yeah, like I, th I think, think it's unlikely, but less unlikely than two years ago that we could end up in a trajectory where AI is never developed um, because we either end up with like some sort of permanent ban um, or some agreement to slow down so much that uh, before we actually get around to doing it, uh, we destroy ourselves in some other way, like through some other technology or something. Um, and this, this still seems unlikely, but the pendulum is swinging and it, it, I, I don't know we have a very fine grained ability to, to sort of choose where it stops. Like you can sort of, it's like an avalanche, you can maybe trigger it, mm, but once it's, it's it. going, you, you, yeah. can, you can call it back. <laughs> yeah. And so, so people then, you know, I don't think we're there yet, but you could imagine it just the stampede of, of consensus forming that AI is a bad thing. And then it becomes taboo to say positive things about AI and then policy makers like competing with one another to be like tough on AI, just as it happens in foreign policy contexts sometimes. And, you know, you could imagine various scenarios in which we kind of go too far in the other direction. Um, well, here may be then, an analogy yeah. with uh, the development of nuclear weapons where you get an arms race where maybe you don't want to develop it in this direction, but the other guy may do it. So you have to do it because the other guy is yeah. going to do it. Yeah. And then, and so on and so forth. And you end up where we are now, something like that, maybe. Um, yeah, that, that certainly is a class of scenarios and it feeds into this current debate about open sourcing AI models, mm -hmm. which has like the obvious thing going for it, that it's nice. More people get access, democratizes AI, more eyes, can detect more problems, et cetera, et cetera. So that's, which is true for other open source AI as well. Like it's generally a nice thing kind of culturally to open source, but with, with the frontier models, there, there is the question of whether that is ultimately the right um, approach, because it does also mean relinquishing any ability to uh, influence how the AI is used. Um, so if you are an AI lab that trains your AI to sort of refuse requests to give advice on how to construct biological weapons or commit cybercrime or whatever else it might be, then if you open source the model, it's usually quite easy then to sort of remove the safeguards. You do some more fine tuning training and you can kind of train the model to actually be of assistance in these ways. And as we move closer to truly transformative AI, of course, if the model is open sourced, anybody with a sufficiently large computer cluster could run it. And it, you, you can sort of call it back if it turns out that there is some additional dimension that could make its capabilities go above uh, a critical threshold. Yeah. Um, these these and, large um, language yeah. models, ChatGPT and so forth, or worse, the Gemini, <laughs> uh, 
uh, embarrassingly bad programs. Are these down the wrong path toward either dystopia or utopia? You think there's something else that'll develop that, and, and this is the wrong uh, way or not, not the direction that this is going to lead to either dystopia or utopia? Um, I mean, I think it's on the sort of um, shortest path towards more capable AI. I think the current models we have are basically uh, the first models uh, that we figured out how to develop that still were very capable. I, th I think the technological trajectory has not been shaped very much about some vision about what type of system ultimately we need that would be the safest. It's just like, it's hard to get AI to work at all. And we try everything and some things work. And the thing that works best currently are these large language models. Or I mean, they are increasingly becoming multimodal models. And it will be interesting to see whether that is all we need. There is like a school of thought uh, it's a scaling hypothesis uh, that basically what we need to do is simply to scale these systems up even more. And just as we saw almost qualitatively new capabilities as you went from uh, GPT-1 to GPT-2 and then GPT-3, new qualitative abilities, GPT-4, you start to see some actual reasoning and understanding there. You know, if we go to GPT-5 or GPT-6, just make them bigger with more data, more training, more parameters, uh, it's possible that things will just fall into place without much further effort. Um, it's also possible that, they, that these will kind of be the engine blocks and you need a little loop, some, some additional little thing on top of this, some external memory system that it can read and write from, um, some agent loop that makes it possible to do uh, more reasoning and planning than is, is feasible in just one forward pass through a big transformer model. But there are a bunch of such ideas already in existence that it might be by sort of combining these in the right way and scaling it up, you would maybe get all the way. Uh, of course, we don't know until it happens. <laughs> what about these examples we saw of just embarrassingly bad uh, searches where the chat GPT is just making up uh, fake law papers and medical uh, findings that didn't even exist or worse, the Gemini uh, you know, imposing DEI ideology onto just basic factual searches like show me pictures of, of the popes and they show pictures of women popes. And I mean, it was just horrible, embarrassingly yeah. bad. Well, so these are the two different classes of problems. So the, the, the latter one, I think, was on purpose. Like it was designed, I mean, obviously not designed specifically that these historical characters should be rendered the way they do, but that, that it, it was the result of a specific attempt to make the outputs of these models feature a more variety of different human types to sort of combat whatever the stereotypes that would result by default if you just trained it on uh, internet data, uh, uh, which, which comes predominantly from certain uh, demographics who just have spent more time writing and posting on the internet and stuff. Uh, so I think there, uh, the, the solution is, is more to sort of change the precise way that it's fine-tuned. Uh, as for the former problem, uh, the problem of hallucination, that's more like a technical problem, like a re re an open research challenge, because they don't want them to hallucinate. Like the people building these, Google doesn't want their AI to do this, but they haven't yet figured out how to completely remove that. I think um, as the AI systems become smarter, I think we will see less of that just as a side effect of the general increase in capabilities. And, and already, I think there is a bit less of that now than there was like a couple of years ago. Um, but yeah, I, I mean, certainly right now it makes sense to, I mean, you should always, <laughs> I think this makes sense when you're getting advice from some human expert or from some human source as well. Like you need to apply your own critical scrutiny to try to, uh, you know, evaluate whether it makes sense or not and it's like doubly true with if you're getting it from these okay AI generators. deep utopia okay the search for utopia has always historically been a bad idea this is a not a good goal to have because it always ends in disaster because somebody is going to block us from reaching utopia and we have to eliminate them you know that you know what i'm talking about here historically yeah. why are you using the word utopia what do you mean by that what, what are you after here for the long-term future well, um, I mean, the word is, so it's not a book about, um, 
how to rearrange the political order or culture uh, or society to achieve some like great outcome, um, which is what most utopias are. Like they're basically some, um, some, some, usually they're like a political program in disguise or a critique of some tendency in contemporary society. Like if, if they're dystopia, then like, which is like the other side, you might say like 1984 or Brave New World, the kind of picking up on some problem in contemporary society and then saying, well, if you continue down this path, then we get to this thing everybody can see is bad. So let's reflect on what we're doing now and maybe course correct. Um, but deep utopia is uh, rather something like a philosophical investigation into questions about human value. Um, if you imagine the whole AI transition going well, so let's take as an assumption, we develop this and we, we don't have any of these existential risks and we end up with this uh, future condition where like the whole economy can be automated. And not only that, but this AI then develops all kinds of other super advanced technologies. Because amongst the jobs that could be automated, if you had truly general AI, uh, truly general AI is of course also the jobs of scientists and researchers and inventors, etc. So um, we then get to, I think, ultimately, if we think through where this eventually leads, a condition of technological maturity, like a condition where we've developed most of those general technologies that, we, that are physically possible and for which there is some conceivable pathway from where we are now. Um, and moreover, in this solved world that we will get, not only do I postulate we have technological maturity, but let's also imagine we solve our coordination problems, politics, like no, no, no wars, like the society is fair, let's just, so all of those are of course extremely important practical problems that, that we need to fix. But I wanted to get actually to the point where you could ask the question as think about what happens then, like assuming everything goes as well as possible. And, and then where do we end up? And what role is there for humans in this world where like we don't need to, well, not only do we not need to work anymore to make a living because like the robots and AIs could produce everything and drive the cars and uh, run the factories and write the word documents or whatever. Um, but a whole bunch of other activities as well that currently occupy our uh, days would become unnecessary in this condition of technological maturity. Um, so right now, even if you didn't have to work, like suppose you're like independently wealthy, uh, like you still a whole bunch of things you need to do. You need, I mean, you need to brush your teeth. Like Bill Gates has to brush his teeth. Otherwise <laughs> he will have tooth decay. There is no way around it, right? Um, similarly, if, if you want to be fit, you have to actually put in some effort on the treadmill or with the weights and there is no shortcut. Um, but at technological maturity, like uh, you could pop a pill that would, Give you the same physiological effects as spending a lot of time working out would do and so you can then go through activities one by one and thinking like do these still make sense in this condition of a solved world and for a lot of activities the answer is seemingly no um, they lose their point insofar as we do them for an instrumental reason that is we do we spend time and effort to do x in order then to achieve some other thing y in most cases like that, in fact, almost all of them, uh, in technological maturity, there would be shortcuts to Y that would seem to make the whole activity of doing X pointless. Um, yeah, okay, let me ask and, you a question. Um, Chat GPT probably can't quite write a book as well as you do, but maybe the next version does. Please write yeah, Nick Bostrom's next rush book. Uh, Would you do that? Or do you actually did, enjoy writing I your did, book? I feel, felt a sense of urgency. to. Uh, I wanted to get it out before the singularity. And that... <laughs> before it writes it for you? <laughs> but don't you enjoy... This, this is my point. Don't you enjoy writing books? I, I don't want an AI to write my yeah. next book. I like writing my right. books. But, so now it feels like a very meaningful thing to do, Right. Yeah. You think, you work, you rework it, and then you hope that in the end it will bring joy to somebody or they will learn something. And, but if, if, they, if it had been possible, like instead of struggling with each paragraph and figuring out what you want to say, if, if, if I could just have pressed like a key on my laptop that would have produced 
the same paragraph or a better paragraph, um, then it's not so clear. Like, would it still feel worthwhile to sit and struggle and sweat uh, if, if it was just like a way of producing worse text and could have been done by just pressing the key that would activate, you know, GPT-8 or whatever to, uh, to do it? Um, it could still do it, but I think um, at least prima facie, at the first sight, it, it seems like it would put a big question mark over that activity. Like, does it really seem valuable to do, even if it were like obviously utterly pointless? And that was a much more sensible, easier way to, to achieve this, exactly the same result. I guess result. I'm trying to find something that uh, has a different value, that is, it's valuable in and of itself. Now, like, there's a lot of projects around my house. I just hire people to do it because I don't like doing it and I don't know what I'm doing. Or I'll just go to Home Depot and buy the kit and just put it together rather than buying the raw supplies and, and make, you know, sawing the wood and whatever. Um, but I like riding my books or I like riding my bike or playing tennis or whatever. I like yeah. working out. Um, I don't want to take a pill to do that. I don't want to pay somebody to ride my bike or, or hire a, a chat GPT to write my next book because I actually enjoy it. So that's a different value. Yeah. Um, yeah, no, I mean, certainly uh, there would be nothing preventing you from uh, still doing those things and many other things. Um, if you value the activity itself, and if you truly value the activity for itself, rather than subtly and in a way that might not be visible to us, uh, actually as a means to an end. For example, uh, I suppose you spend a lot of time writing because it actually... Uh, made you happy like it made you subjectively feel good uh well there that would be a shortcut right like you could take a pill that would give you the same uh, mm. subjective happiness and good feelings and a, a pill moreover without side effects or addiction potential etc adds technological maturity no uh, nick so it no really uh, it, it's the challenge that makes it valuable and not, not just some glow feeling that's not what i'm right, after right. So that, the, that's right yeah. so, so there is like a whole pulse big set of possible reasons for working hard on the book. And some of those reasons would be removed in this hypothetical context. And it's like onion, layers of onion you can peel away. And the, and the question that the book is kind of exploring is like, what remains after you really remove all the instrumental stuff? And I think there does remain something. Um, um, but it's quite subtle. Um, but I think ultimately there is a whole set of values that are currently a little bit often invisible to us um, that would come into view uh, and that it would make sense to focus more on if, if sort of the, the screaming moral imperatives of everything you have to do, like you have to go to work, otherwise you don't get the paycheck and how are you going to afford your rent? You have to, you know, um, help drive your kid to school because otherwise i mean what's going to happen otherwise you have to do this so much stuff that we have to do that that and if you look at around the world obviously there are huge needs everywhere that we should try to help fix um if you imagine all of that going away then i think there are many more subtle quieter almost like aesthetic values that it would be appropriate to allow to have a bigger influence on what we do just just as you know, you walk out at night and you see this big canopy of stars and constellations. Now, they are always there, right? They are there during the day as well. It's just the, the blazing sun kind of uh, makes them invisible. But if you imagine removing the sun, suddenly all of this, this rich iridescent sky of more subtle values would come into view. And I think our sort of evaluative pupils should dilate in this condition of technological maturity to, to place more weight on those values. And there is a whole range of them. Um, and I think it is from, from these constellations of quieter values that, the, the, that utopia would be constructed. Or at least if you, if you imagine a utopia that has a rich structure as opposed to a sort of simple hedonic utopia where we become kind of pleasure blobs uh, through like super drugs or direct neural stimulation. But if, if, if you imagine a more richly textured and structured utopia, I think the structure would come from a range of these canopy values that that would come into view. Um, yeah, um, I had Andrew Yang on the podcast a couple of years ago. He was the presidential candidate pushing the UBI, Universal Basic Income. At the time, he was concerned about AI taking over um, taxi drivers, truck drivers, and so on. It was going to be 
hundreds of thousands of people put out of work. Now that hasn't happened yet, but it could. But this is like saying, well, what are we gonna, a century ago, what are we gonna do with all those elevator operators, the little guy in there pushing the buttons for you? Well, there aren't any of those anymore. They went and found something else to do. Now, can we say that most jobs are kind of crappy and no one really wants to do them, they do them because they have to make a living. So in a post-scarcity, Treconomics kind of model, nobody has to do the shit work anymore. They can just write poetry or do art or write books or I don't know what, maybe they'll, they'll find other meaningful things to do. And that, that is well infinite. There's, there's no upper ceiling on finding meaningful things to do. Yeah. Well, I mean, the question is whether they are meaningful. There's a lot of things you could do and you could also not do them. Um, but would they be meaningful? So right now, if, for example, you work hard and it allows you to support your family and take good care uh, of, like that, that gives meaning to your efforts, like the, the boring office work, maybe not so meaningful in itself, but if it achieves this outcome of, of giving, like making your home a good environment for your, 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 your spouse and for your children, like that, you know, gives meaning or if you work hard for a charity and it helps save the life of, you know, some disadvantaged like group, that's like you have achieved something and done some good in your world. Or you're a scientist and you work hard and you like invent something new, like either theoretically interesting or practically useful, that's like you have achieved something. Um, so those kinds of meaning might not, might be in short supply in this, uh, in, in this solved world in that, you know, whatever the scientists could do would be much better done by AI scientists. And uh, you, you wouldn't need to be a breadwinner because the bread would already be won uh, through the economic abundance, um, etc. cetera. There, there would be no starving children uh, in Utopia. So no need to well, yeah, work okay, for let's, a charity. Let's look at the economics of it. Okay, I can see the argument for let's raise the lower bar as high as we can so no one is suffering everybody has three square meals a day roof over their head education health care um and so forth what's the upper ceiling uh, i mean it seems like you know I, I here i was thinking of david deutsch's book the beginning of infinity there's an infinite amount of knowledge we can find problems to solve Wh why would that end well there are two questions there one is whether it would end uh, but Let's, and we can return to that, but there is a, a second kind of almost preceding question, which is even if there is more to discover, whether uh, we would be efficient at discovering it. So I'm suggesting even if there's like important scientific research to be done at technological maturity, it would be much more efficiently done by uh, machine intelligences. Mm. Um, and so we wouldn't really, like, it would just be a waste of resources to, for, for a human to exert calories to, like, try to think about these things. And AI would do it much better and much quicker and with, like, uh, cheaper. Um, so, so that's, yeah, even if there was more, I think it, we, we wouldn't be useful uh, for discovering it. Um, it's also possible, although this is an independent idea, that... Um, Although there's always more to discover, the most important things might be at some point already discovered. And then uh, it's kind of more and more trivial details that remain to be uh, added to the scientific uh, inventory of knowledge, mm. um, which I think is also likely actually, but... Uh, um, you do? What if, what if you're that guy in 1896 that said, um, you know, we've pretty much got physics all figured out here just before Einstein? <laughs> Yeah, he he was just a bit early. <laughs> I see. He's a century early. Okay. <laughs> yeah, or two, or whatever. But yeah. I mean, we've only been around. I mean, how long has science been gone just for a couple hundred years yeah. or something? Right? Yeah. It's like trivial in the big scheme of things. Yeah. Um, and we don't even have super intelligent AIs to actually really get cranking on uh, making intellectual progress. We're trying to do it with our meat brains, and so mm. a few hundred years with meat brains. Like, of course, there's still more to to learn. So maybe an example of what you're talking about would be, how do we solve the problem of schizophrenia? We don't really know yet, and we haven't made much progress, but maybe AI could test a thousand different uh, chemical compound um, uh, combinations to see what works, and it could do it in a couple of days rather than a couple of decades that humans would take to do it. And that would be a solved problem 
but why would there be at some point no no well I, okay so you're saying there's a finite number of problems to be solved for human flourishing um yeah well um so at some point i think you have uh, basically found the optimal ways of technologically achieving the types of outcomes that normally need to be achieved you've invented the optimal solar panel you've invented the optimal space colonizing rocket you have invented the best way of transmitting electricity from one point to another like etc etc et so that might be like you know like trillion types of tasks at that level of description and like for each one of them you have worked out at the molecular level what the most efficient mechanism is to do it or maybe not the most efficient maybe they're like tiny you could improve it by like one tenth of one percentage point by researching it for another thousand years and the AIs would be working to like make these small optimizations but it wouldn't be like discovering relativity theory or, or evolution theory or something like that that like a simple insight that has like like a big earthquake of uh, ramifications for the way we perceive ourselves and the world. Yeah. All right, I'm going to read from your book here, uh, the lines from Harry Lyme, the third man. You know what the fellow said in Italy for 30 years under the Borgias. They had warfare, terror, murder, and bloodshed, but they produced Michelangelo, Leonardo da Vinci, and the Renaissance. In Switzerland, they had brotherly love. They had 500 years of democracy and peace. And what did that produce? The cuckoo clock. <laughs> so how do you address that point that humans need challenge again let's distinguish between happiness and meaningfulness slash purposefulness it's those challenges that give us meaning and purpose that's the goal not happiness um yeah well um uh, it's it's hard to tell um certainly if it were happiness in the subjective sense of positive affect it would make the problem very easy because trivially in utopia technological maturity you could tune your hedonic well-being up or down very easily through, through, through newer technology or drugs and stuff so if that's what we wanted then we would be home and dry like problem solved we'll yeah. definitely be able to do a lot of that in utopia um, if we want challenge well certainly we could create artificial challenges uh, there are games uh, very elaborate games with like all kinds of um, you could have AIs inventing new games for us, like that could be, so if artificial challenges are enough to realize that value that you pointed to, then also we are home and dry. That, that would also be very easy to do. If we want genuinely meaningful challenges, then there is more of a challenge uh, in, in seeing how that would be possible in deep utopia. Because prima facie, at least at first sight, it seems like our own efforts are, for most purposes, unnecessary. And then we could still do the thing, but it may not obviously be meaningful to do the thing if, if there is nothing worthwhile achieved by doing it. But I do think there are uh, at least ways of rescuing part of what we want if we want meaningful challenge, even in utopia. And that might be, first of all, uh, tasks that need to be performed by humans. Like, so for example, if there are, to take a very simple example, consumers that have a preference uh, not just for a certain type of object, but also a preference regarding how that object should have been manufactured. Uh, and in particular, they want it to have been manufactured by hand, you know, or by human. Then that would be demand for human labor to produce. We see that today, like so the consumers might pay more for a trinket that's done by some favorite group or an like in, indigenous tribe rather than in a sweatshop in Malaysia. Like even if the trinket is the same, or equivalent, like the fact that the causal process that brought it about was different might result in a difference in price. Um, similarly, we might prefer to watch like human athletes compete, even if like the robots could run faster or box harder or whatever. Yeah. Like that might just be a brute, brute fact about it. And so you can then see like, or we might want like a, a, a robot, uh, you know, priest administering the wedding, or well, sorry, uh, like a human doing it rather than you know, a robot, even if the robot could say the same words, etc. So you could then, you could look through, like, and, and there might be many more of these that we can't afford currently, so nobody has kind of even bothered inventing these services, but where, where, where just humans have a sort of brute preference for it to be done by human effort. Um, and I think, in addition to that, there might be more subtle ways in which um, that would be instrumental uses for human effort. If, for example, we have values 
So, say, say you have a value that values the honoring of a certain tradition. Now, many traditions, in order to be continued, would need the active efforts of human beings to do whatever the things that are traditionally done. To, to, to have the, the, the ceremonies and to like focus our attention on certain things. And even if we could perform, like create robots that went around and like perform the same songs and dances and stuff, like it wouldn't count as continuing that tradition. So if we value that, it might call upon us to, 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 to make an effort. And that might be one of these subtle values. Or maybe right now the tradition is like, well, our tradition is tradition, like, whatever, you know, there are starving kids out there, we should focus on helping those. But once all the kids are fed and all the diseases are cured, then these slightly less, like, uh, shrill values might then deserve a lot of attention. And aesthetic values, like, there might be things we have reason to do, because it would just be beautiful if, if somebody did it. And uh, um, social cultural entanglements, like the way that the, the different people have preferences about each other and what they do and how that, I think that might also produce um, some opportunities for um, um, natural purpose in, academia, in, in utopia. Um, you can also have artificial purpose where you just set yourself an arbitrary challenge and then have your brain motivated, uh, changed so that you're like super motivated to achieve it. That, that, that would be easy, but there might also be some of these more natural purposes. Um, well, there is this DIY, you know, do-it-yourself movement where people seem to like just doing it by hand. They just want to get their tools out and get up in the garage and start making stuff. I don't personally like this because I'm not very good at that, but it's a huge movement. So, I mean, you could hire somebody or there's a machine that could make the little shed better than you can make it by hand, but people seem to like to do that. Why not have both? The AI does the stuff we don't like to do, and then I'm just going to do the stuff I do like to do. Yeah, no, that uh, that seems uh, seems good. Now there is an additional challenge here, which is uh, lifespans could become very long, right? If we fix the things that cause disease and death and like cellular decay, etc. So um, if you are going to live for maybe millions or billions of years, potentially. <laughs> okay. Um, uh, you sort of run out of Listen, like... Nick, just get me to 100 without Alzheimer's, all right? <laughs> well, that's a good start. But, you know, when you're 100 in perfect health... Yeah, I'll uh, go for 200. Maybe you think, well, do I really want to check out now? No, or I maybe don't. do another yeah. year. Yeah. Let's, yeah. Let's, let's push it a little bit further down. And at least it would be nice for you to have the option of kind of... Uh, because like... I mean, probably our like our age when 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 we were a kid, like being fifty or sixty or whatever, old. that's like now, oh, that's I like know. ridiculous. You might <laughs> as well. I don't. But now, of course, when you're there, you see that well, you know, there's a lot more that yeah could be done and experienced, and the um, and there are simple pleasures as well. So they're like the things you might only want to do once or twice in life, but then you've done them. But then there are like other like a nice cup of tea or a coffee, like it's kind of about as good as you know on the tenth thousand times you do it and then you know on the first or second you don't really run it it's renewable as it were like a yeah. renewable source of joy and so um but but it does mean also like one should maybe think of if the question is what's the best possible future life that you could have if you remove all practical constraints and technological constraints um you really should think maybe in terms of a trajectory not not just a state that you would reach and then you have sort of reached the peak, but more like what's a developmental trajectory that would uh, like be a, you'd, you'd get the most out of each level of development. Maybe eventually you've like understood most things that can be understood by human brain. Maybe at that point you would want to upgrade it a little bit, like go like some more neurons or whatever. So you could kind of explore the next level. And, but like, what's the right pace of that? Like, do you want to just rush to the end and become like, uh, like a planetary sized super intelligence immediately or or would you like want to you know take the scenic routes and then uh, maybe spend a few hundred years first being a biological humans and doing whatever can be done as a human and then slowly increment um so so these are some of the uh the questions that come up and so many more uh there's a lot of things to think about hopefully we will actually uh uh, yeah, secure the future in us that... Uh, well, yeah, again, incrementally. I like Kevin Kelly's approach. Protopia, not utopia or dystopia. Just one small... Make life 
tiny bit better tomorrow than it is today. Don't aim for utopia. Just as a tool, just make life a little bit better. Don't worry about 500 years from now, just tomorrow. Um, I think that uh, al 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 allows one to avoid a bunch of uh, uh, mischief that is, is uh, performed in the name of grand visions. Mm, yeah. um, but I do think also sometimes it's useful to lift your gaze up and, and look at the horizon or like reflect on where you're going. Like yeah, there's sure. the next step yeah. and the next step. But ultimately, um, so we are like our human civilization, all this effort spent on science and technology and economic growth and everything, but very little effort spent on thinking what, what, where do we end up if this continues? Sure. Uh, but but and, just, let's uh, talk about creativity for a, a moment. Your book I really enjoyed because it's completely different than any most nonfiction science books that I read. You know, you have this kind of dialogue, this conversation, you're in a classroom, you're lecturing, you have handouts, students are asking questions. That was pretty creative and new. Uh, if you had asked ChatGPT to write your next book, I don't think it would have come up with that. You see where I'm going with this. What about music? What's the origin of rock and roll? Well, folk music and jazz. All right. So in a century from now, what will be the next big you know, musical trend. I don't know. I don't think it's possible to know. And I don't see how an AI would anticipate the next creative movement, not just in the arts and poetry or whatever, but in anything. Uh, you know, there's, you know, there's only so many combinations, I guess. Maybe it could grind through all the possible combinations for music that's going to be enjoyed by people. That seems to me, though, next to impossible to program. Yeah, I might not be able to predict it. Um, I mean, there's a lot of things that you couldn't predict if, even with you if you're a super intelligence like that like even just like the weather like a year into the future wh whether on a particular minute it will be raining and it's like chaotic systems right and with something like creativity over the time scale of a century um it, it the actual answer to that question will depend on what a lot of smart people are doing in the course of that century maybe other ais even smarter than the one that you think would be making the prediction and it itself will interact with so this, but um, even if it's not predictable, what creative results will it, you know, precisely be attained uh, a century hence? It might still be possible that the actual uh, creative work is more efficiently done by AIs as this century unfolds. They might just be making the best paintings and writing the most beautiful poems and creating the most compelling movies, etc. It's certainly not the case right now. I mean, current. Large language models are have a sort of uh, cliche is maybe too strong a word, but there is a sort of mid-brow quality to their output that there's like the it's good, but it's not great. It's kind of the uh, typical thing that some person would say in a situation uh, that they can produce more of that. But great stuff comes from kind of not just following along with the patterns that are already out there, but sort of um, looking at reality afresh with new eyes, w whether the reality is inside yourself or outside of yourself and really letting it speak to you. And that, then do you sort of speak the words that come from your perception uh, of, of this piece of reality that, is, that you're focusing on? And so it's like a different source kind of of information. But um, I have no doubt that that AI will become increasingly creative. I think it's not a binary thing. I think we already see little glimpses of lower level creativity, and I think the next generation will have more, and then more and more beyond that. Uh, for example, a few years ago, DeepMind system AlphaGo uh, had had this move. What was it, thirty two or something? Thirty seven? I forget. But it was like in the match that AlphaFold was playing against Lisa Dahl, the human. Uh, Go champion, and there was a particular move that experts in Go thought was immensely original and creative. It was something no human would ever have played. That all the masters would advise, like students, that that was an error. But then it still turns out. Like if you think a little bit more, you just realize how right it was, and it set everything up to win the the game later. So that's within a sort of somewhat circumscribed domain, but certainly like creative within that domain. And I think the domains in which you will be able to have these like genuine uh, deep uh, creativity will, will be expanding as the capabilities of the AIs increase. Yeah, when I was a professor at Occidental College, we had a music professor there who was also a gifted pianist. 
And he would once a year hold these impromptu concerts where he would, in the auditorium, the grand piano on stage, he sits there, and then people would call out, like, requests, like, do Beethoven's X as if, you know, Elvis did it. <laughs> or, you know, in the rock and roll. Right. And and people just come up with the craziest, th and he would do it. And it's like, God <laughs> damn, that's great. So maybe if you had an AI, you could, you could find all the different creative permutations on all the different music that has been done and then test it in the marketplace. Well, what do people actually yeah. like? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, so there's a right now the question of quality, like the, the actual output is not great. And if we imagine the quality problem being fixed, then there is the question of whether people would still value it less because it was produced by AI. Even if, if you sort of listen to a blind test, right? A and B, you're not told which one is. Even if people prefer the AI output in that context, if it, the quality became like as good or superior, uh, it then we get to this like further question of value, whether you still prefer it just because you know that the human did it. Um, there's also the, I mean, there's like so many uh, uh, branches sticking out from here, but like one possible reason you might have for preferring the human output is if you think the human, but not the AI experienced various things when they wrote it, like actually experienced the joy or the sadness that you know, the, the musical piece expressed. Um, but there again, I think with digital minds, it might also be possible to create phenomenal experiences in digital substrates. Um, and so AIs also might have had experiences uh, that they could be expressing in their works. It, it's not, not clear exactly how, where we are on, on that path towards AI sentience, but I think certainly in principle, it is possible. Um, I'm a kind of computationalist about Mm. phenomenal content yeah um, that subjective yeah. element of art where the fraudulent copy painting of a classic painting plummets in value the moment people find out it's fake even if you can't tell yeah. the difference with your own eye yeah 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 so um so if that's the model then you know there might be uh still demand for human painters to yeah there now, sort of relatively. back to the economics I, I mentioned, you know, l uh, pulling up everybody from the bottom up to some level. But, you know, economists tell us there's this thing called the hedonic treadmill. But there is no, there is no bottom level. People will always want more. Uh, and that, that's just going to never end. You know, the McMansions. Houses are like two to three times the size they were in the 1950s, even for the average worker. And, you know, that, that there's no upper ceiling on how much more stuff people are going to want. How do you think about that? Yeah, I think there are uh, 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 parts of our preference functions that are um, non-satiable uh, um, collectively because, like, yeah, we have these desires for positional goods to have more than another. Like, you want your yacht to be the biggest in the world, so you build a 200, you know, foot yacht, and then some other billionaire bastard builds one that's like 205. And then, so it's impossible for both of these uh, people to have their preferences satisfied to own themselves exclusively the biggest yacht in the world. Um, so that's one example for how uh, collectively there could be preferences that the humans have that you can't all be satisfied. And there are many other examples where two people want the same piece of land or the same, be the exclusive love interest of the same person, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so um, now it doesn't enable sort of unlimited economic growth if you define growth ultimately in preference satisfaction terms. And so like, because one person's gain is another's loss in this scenario. Um, and it also doesn't necessarily create uh, an unending uh, reason for human economic labor if there is no way to make more money then no matter how each of these billionaires wish they could make their yacht a bit bigger than the others, uh, like if, if they can't actually make more money by working, or if the extra money they could make by working is kind of trivial to the amount of money they are already getting from their uh, capital gains, then there would be no incentive for them to put out effort for that reason. Um, and that's like already true for many billionaires, like there's like, yeah, they could take a job and make an extra 100,000 a year maybe, but if they're already sitting on 20 billion, it's like, 
it's not not really making a meaningful difference to their purchasing power. Yeah, but you have people like Elon Musk and Jeff Bezos. You know, they 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 didn't yeah. they're not so just sitting they, on they, the beach. You know, they're no, gonna they, they, exactly and and they, and they can. Uh, um, I mean, so, so, uh, still add a lot of eco, even just economic value through their work. Yeah. Like like obviously Tesla would be worth a lot less if uh, Elon uh, called it quits. Yeah. Um, and. Uh, um, so, so even just from a purely economic point of view, they still have the ability to contribute m amounts of economic value that are significant, even relative to the, uh, uh, um, their net worth. <clears throat> and because they have, like, unique, like Elon has unique skills. Also, I think there are opportunities sometimes for very wealthy people to sort of combine their human capital with their financial capital to do things that are hard to do by taking one person with capital and one person uh, with, with brains because they're like trust problems and communication problems. So sometimes they need to be combined in one person to certain opportunities are more easily realizable. Um, but for many others, it's not the case. And uh, uh, they're, they're already like in this situation where it makes no sense to work for money. Yeah, uh, but I guess my point is, you know, there's stories about Elon Musk sleeping on the floor in his factories. He doesn't have to do any of that, but he does it because that's what gives him value. And I think more people would want that than would just want to sit on the beach. Yeah, I think he's doing it because he wants to achieve various things that can't be achieved without him doing it. Yeah. Um, now, if he could create, like, I don't know, like some sort of Android replica of himself <laughs> that would do the same thing and achieve the same results for, for Tesla and SpaceX, etc., cetera, and, and he could... Be on the beach. I have no idea. Maybe he would prefer that. He has said that his life is pretty painful often, and that um, so it might be that he does it because there are various outcomes he wants, as opposed to valuing the activity itself mm. of running. Maybe around of course we don't know everything. what's in his head, but uh, yeah. you know, I think in general people like challenges because that's what makes life meaningful, and it's essentially an infinite number of challenges we could always have. But I could be wrong. Okay. On the economic model, so people are living longer. Let's not get crazy. Let's just say people live 200 years or 300 years rather than 100. Yeah, but in uh, 300 years of research into extending life, don't you think somebody could I don't could know. You know Kurzweil another... thinks it's coming by 24. What's the, the uh, takeoff point? At 2045, I think he said, where um, maybe it's even sooner than that, where the amount of extra life you get exceeds every year of your life and then you have the what does he call it the take 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 off point something, something like that so you Longevity, can look, escape velocity. yeah i don't yeah, escape velocity that's it yeah i you know when i hear these things i think back to religion <laughs> it's like i feel like i'm you know we're the chosen generation we're the ones that get to live forever i've heard this before <laughs> when i was religious yeah. right you know maybe you know but it, i think the problems are much harder than most uh, longevity researchers think um, but you know, it, it's possible, but okay, let me, let me carry out the thought experiment. All right. So we have 8 billion people now. It's probably going to top off around uh, 2050 and start to decline by 2100 or so. And as you know, Elon's worried about a, a birth dearth, the richer and more economically stable and more educated people are, the fewer babies they have. So, um, how do you square that with uh, people living longer and the population increasing? How do you think about that? Yeah, I think there are various... Uh, long-term trends that I think would deserve um, attention if it were for the fact that I also believe that we are probably relatively close to this transformative technological uh, overhaul over the current, of the current human condition. Um, so that I think that the game board will be overturned for, for better or worse, but uh, with, within you know, likely some years or a few decades and that these like, longer demographic trends uh, won't really have time to uh, play out, mm. would be my guess. There might be other demographic trends that then kick in. If you do invent this new world with AIs and digital minds that can obviously copy themselves instantaneously, if you're like software, you could make a million copies of yourself in an afternoon, right? If you have available hardware. So you could have like different population dynamics that could become problematic, but, but that, that wouldn't sort of just be an extrapolation of, of what we're currently seeing with the human uh, uh, situation. Also, also like some, I, I mean, I, I see the, the projections and how like birth rates are going down and if that continues, like, like, but some skepticism about our, the reliability of these long range forecasts. Mm -hmm. Like, I mean, when I grew up, the, the big worry about was about overpopulation mm -hmm. and 
there, there were these like public intellectuals who the club of rome and everything yeah. and that was like and they had little mathematical models that show this mm -hmm. um now, now it's going the other way and i mean who knows in 30 years from now if there's no AI transition maybe it just turns out that something has changed and it's overpopulation again like or some other um so it, it's like yeah our ability to make this very long run, run range forecast are, are uh open to question i think yeah you know stein's law things that can't go on forever won't <laughs> and there's some corollary to it but but they can go on a lot longer than you think <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> Yeah, some things have gone on for longer than <laughs> yeah. one would have guessed. Well, I, mean, I guess that... in the next, you know, you want to look at the far horizon. Do we need to leave the planet, become a multi-planetary species because of either overpopulation or we're going to run out of raw supplies and and uh, and resources? I mean, population can ultimately outrun any space uh, settlement program because ultimately, even with mature technology, we are limited by the speed of light. And so... If you imagine a sphere growing at the speed of light, even in all directions, right? The, the volume of that grows polynomially with time. And so the resources that we could potentially use for civilization or for like that can at most grow uh, polynomially, whereas population can grow exponentially. It can, in theory, like, you know, double every generation or 10%. And so eventually the exponential will uh, overtake the polynomial if you have unrestricted uh, population growth and if like we end up in in a situation where sort of people have more than the replacement rate of children that that would eventually just overtake so so the the, the space uh, settlement would at, at most kind of delay uh, bumping up against resource limits and ultimately you would have to just figure out some way to uh, maybe uh, 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 coordinate to, to, to bring only uh, the number of people, new people into existence that, that could be supported at a high level of living, which might still be a lot of new people into existence. But if you overshoot that, then eventually average income would have to drop. Uh, right now, we have more like kind of increasing returns to population because um, more people means more ideas and division of labor, which makes, so, so right now, probably per capita income goes up if population increases. But I think at some point um, that will no longer be the case. And the limiting factor of the economy at technological maturity will eventually become land, as it's referred to, basically resources that you can't make more of, as opposed to labor or uh, technological advances that that will already have sort of been maximized and so then land only grows polynomially in mm. the limit and uh, that that would be the sort of maximum rate at which the population could grow in the limit um, as well and what's your time horizon there you know thousands of years or tens of thousands of years uh well i think um there are really sort of two key variables uh, there's a question of how far from now until we get super intelligence um and then from there on I, it might not take that long because once you have super intelligence that makes super duper intelligence and then like some kind of op substrate optimized for a cognitive performance that can i would imagine relatively quickly develop um, all kinds of technological solutions that start to approximate the physical limits. I, I don't know whether, whether that would take like months or decades, but well, so it's hard to is talking about planetary super brains, brains kind of working for like creating a space rocket for like yeah. So Kurzweil like was talking about twenty forty five in his next his next book, the Singularity is nearer coming out in June uh, twenty forty five. So but after that, anything's game. I mean, we just probably unpredictable uh, what the time horizon could be. Yeah, I mean, I don't even think we can rule out very short time scales. Yeah. Like, we don't know GPT-5 or GPT-6 won't right. be right. there. I mean, we don't know that they will, but here we really have to think probabilistically, right, and have like a smeared out probability distribution, I yeah. think, over different or Okay, you're dates. one of my favorite big minds, so let's keep going on the, the long horizon. All right, let's apply the Copernican principle to our species. We're not special. The chances are, you know, we're in the middle of the bell curve of civilizations, that would have uh, done everything you just described. Uh, surely there's extraterrestrial intelligences out there that have already done all this uh, and built uh, self-replicating von Neumann machines and, and Dyson spheres and so on. 
So uh, answer me, uh, Fermi's paradox. Where is everybody? Um, most likely just like very far away, like outside our light cone, um, which would, uh, yeah, explain why we haven't seen them. Of course, if the universe is infinite as it seems to be with infinitely many planets and stuff, then there would be infinitely many of them out there. But the density might be quite low. Um, we, we don't really have, it seems to me, any particular reason to think that um, it would be easy for a, like an Earth-like planet to produce life, let alone intelligent life. I mean, there might just have been some ridiculously improbable steps somewhere, like to get the first simple replicators going, or maybe to go from prokaryote to eukaryote or something. Maybe that just happens in like one planet out of 10 to the power of 40 planets or something. Um, now then you might think, wow, wasn't it then like, what's a miracle that it happened here on Earth? Well, if there are infinite many planets out there, then even if the chance for any one of them is ridiculously small, it would still happen, right, with certainty, infinitely many times. And then an observation selection effect would explain why we find ourselves on a planet where this improbable thing did happen. Like only those planets are observed by people uh, evolving on them. And of course, the others, there is nobody there to... Uh, so uh, that that seems like pretty likely. Um, um, if one wants to think that life is more common, then one has to, I think, um, either postulate some kind of zoo hypothesis, uh, like where they are deliberately uh, hiding themselves, or uh, like um, my colleague Robin Hanson has some scenario in which uh, 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 there might be others and it, is like take too long to explain, but yeah, there's a, there are like it's. I, I also think like I don't know. I mean, it probably takes us like too far afield from our, our current conversation. But this whole simulation, yeah, uh, argument stuff, um, which which kind of adds another dimension to the whole. Where and and where do you stand on our, the simulation hypothesis? Uh, well, I mean, I days. I mean, I, I believe in the simulation argument, having uh, more than fifty percent. United that, yeah. So I I think that's sound and. Uh, now that only shows one of three possibilities is correct. One of which is the simulation hypothesis. And so you would then need some additional information or consideration if you wanted to sort of pick between these three alternatives that the simulation argument establishes. Um, I would say, I mean, and I think, as a, so to, to me, when I wrote this paper back in, in like the early 2000s, it, it like I was pretty, Clear that we were sort of on a path to develop increase the, the technologies that you would need to create these ancestor simulations or detailed simulations with conscious, um, like like super advanced virtual reality and digital brains. Like now, I think it's maybe easier for people to imagine that because just we've seen kind of twenty years, twenty four years of technological advancement. Like virtual reality is a lot better now than it was in two thousand one, and. Obviously, AI is moving ahead, so it's like a smaller imaginative leap to think that at some point in the future, some technologically mature, civil, like really advanced civilization might have the ability to create simulations that are like perfectly realistic to the people inside them. Um, and uh, uh, yeah, like so, so in, in some sense, the opportunities to hop off the train before you reach the conclusion or like diminishing as, as we sort of yeah. pass by the stations. You know, I had David Chalmers on the, on the show. He has, a, you know, as you know, an entire book on, on the simulation, morals in a simulation and ethics and so on. Very interesting. But ultimately he says right in there, this is not a testable hypothesis. We, there's no way to know if we're in a simulation or not. So then what are we talking about here? This is just science fiction or metaphysics or, or what? No, I mean, I think it, um, there are certainly possible observations um, uh, that are such that if we made them, they would give us strong evidence either for or against the simulation hypothesis. So like to take the most obvious example, like if a window suddenly popped up in your visual field saying, you're in a simulation, <laughs> click here for more information. Right. And, a little buffery. Uh, <laughs> I signed the terms and services, like that, right. that would pretty like prove it to you, right? Yeah. Like if that, yep. um, conversely, the absence of such a window popping up is by the principle of conservation of evidence, must be some evidence against the simulation hypothesis, like weak evidence, because, uh, it, but, but still some evidence. And, but more, um, I guess, um, relevantly, I think 
if you consider the simulation argument, which has the structure that at least one of three propositions has to be true, one of which is the simulation hypothesis, anything that gives you evidence for or against the other two indirectly then uh, affects the probability you should assign to the simulation hypothesis. So, um, for example, one of the alternatives is that almost all civilizations at our current stage of technological development go extinct before they reach technological maturity. So that's something you could believe instead of the simulation yes. hypothesis. But there has to be a very strong convergence. It can't just be like 80% of them. It has to be like basically all. Um, and it, of course, if we make it through to technological maturity, that would be very strong evidence against this idea that basically all of them fail to get to technological maturity. So therefore, anything, any evidence we get for or against the idea that we will reach technological maturity would bear indirectly through the simulation argument on the probability of the simulation hypothesis. So the closer we get to technological maturity ourselves, the less likely that alternative is, and hence the more likely the simulation hypothesis is. And you could imagine um, the extreme uh, version of this, which is if we ourselves develop all the technologies needed to create ancestor simulations, and we are just about to switch them on, and we want to switch them on, and we're sort of about to reach the press the button, that would pretty much conclusively rule out the two alternatives to the simulation hypothesis. It would show that like, it's not the case that nobody reaches this level of technological maturity. It's not the case that almost nobody of those who do reach that uh, remain interested in creating access to simulations. And uh, so in that situation where we turn on our own simulations, we would have to conclude that we are almost certainly ourselves in one. Um, and so those would be some ways of getting very strong evidence. And then, but I think anything that then indirectly has some probabilistic bearing on these alternatives also sort of indirectly has some evidential connection to the simulation hypothesis. So I think there's a lot of ways to test it, uh, but these tests are probabilistically. Yeah. Uh, uh, well, uh, did you mention what if we're first? Somebody has to be first. Yeah, well, that, that's uh, what it's for, did you say? Or, or if it's first. No, we're first. Yeah, we're the first. Uh, I mean, right. some yeah, civilization yeah, I mean, has to be first. Maybe yeah, it's us. And that would just be um, very unlikely if there were to ultimately um, be, say, a million simulations of experience is just like the ones you're having. Um, and you can't from the inside tell the difference whether you're like number 537,648 <laughs> or whether you're like number one. But in that condition where you have some evidence and you could either be one of the vast majority of people with your experiences that are simulated or like this very exceptional one that's not simulated and there's doesn't feel any difference from the inside, I think there a kind of principle of indifference should make you assign a proportionately low credence to yeah, you being sure. the first one, like yeah. the exceptional one. Yeah, but again, um, somebody has to be first. I guess you're saying in, in first, the age of the universe. If, if, if most people think they are, then almost all of them will be wrong. Yes. So <laughs> right. it looks like a rational betting odds in that scenario like would be to assign a very small probability to that. Um, and, and there's more arguments, I think, supporting that... It, like, in fact, my, my doctoral dissertation was, was like developing a theory of observation selection effects. And I think there are mm. various areas in, uh, in physics and cosmology and uh, to some extent in evolutionary biology that, where you have to reason along roughly those lines to, to be able to get sensible results when you try to connect current cosmological models with the predictions that intuitively confirm or disconfirm them. Some sort of, roughly speaking, assumption that you're like, and uh, you should think of yourself as you were a randomly selected observer. Well, as there's a lot of complications around that, but that's like some, something in that general direction seems to... The, Let the me ask you a te technical question here on a simulation. Like in Star Trek's um, holodeck, you know, Worf goes in there and he has a fight with some other Klingon and he gets knocked down. How does a virtual reality interact with a physical body to say, maybe you want to have a boxing match with Muhammad Ali in this virtual reality? How does he? How does the virtual reality actually knock me down? Well, I mean, so in the simulation argument, I think uh, the 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 most well. So there, your mind is itself implemented digitally. 
Oh, like, so there is no me to knock down. It's it's well, all you digital. Are, yeah, there is a you, but the you is like it digitally instantiated, see, and yeah. you have like an, a, it, an avatar. Yeah, that your digital mind is connected to like a digital avatar, and uh, the, the same sensory uh, afferents that like um, currently are going from your sensory nerves. Yeah. Okay. In, in I your see. I see. Yeah. Okay. Like, 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 like that. That's like equivalent nerves are going into this digital brain with the same information and yeah, okay. producing the same subjective. Now, experience. the simulation would at some point have to run on actual hardware, right? Right. Do you? How? How can you possibly have enough computing power to replicate everyone who ever lived, and not just their physical bodies and, or I guess, their minds? I mean, there's this mind uploading business about copying the connectome. That's not enough. It's not enough just to have the synapses copied. You'd have to copy every single molecule in every one of the synapses in the gaps. Yeah, I don't think so. Uh, I think um, that a sufficient level uh, of uh, granularity of a simulation to produce conscious experience would be like the synaptic level, um, you know, Possibly you could simplify it even more. Um, you mean to get a general memory? Because memories are stored, I mean, I'm told by memory neuroscientists that you need, it's not just the connectome. It's not just those synaptic, you know, sort of wired in things. You need the, all the molecules and all that stuff as part of memory. Yeah, well, some aspects of that. I mean, and clearly there are like new, neurotransmitters that are like swimming around in big, but I think the bulk of the information processing um, is probably done at the uh, level of ac action potentials and synaptic connections. I mean, that's what we see with current uh, AI systems, l large language models, or these neural networks or artificial neural networks are essentially simplified neurons with simplified synapses. And they do seem to perform, uh, I mean, insofar as AI has advanced, like the same kinds of tasks that the human brain, like in terms of, say, visual perception, which is like a relatively well-developed area um, of AI, like with a comparable number of neurons that the visual cortex has, you can perform comparable level of discrimination and object recognition, etc. cetera. Um, I think, um, and, and indeed, current uh, AIs are starting to still have fewer parameters than, than the human brain has. So, and, and they are also like a little bit less smart than the human brain, but it roughly kind of strikingly seems to match the performance that you would expect by matching it to biological. Okay. It might be that the biological neuron certainly is more complex than one of these artificial neurons. So maybe you get 10 times more performance per biological neuron than you get from one of these simplified uh, representations. But I think... Um, that would be my guess. Now, you could have enough computing power to go down a little bit below the level of synapse if somehow you needed it. Uh, not, not all the way down to elementary particles. Then, yes, it would become e computationally intractable if you had to simulate the whole Schrodinger equation of a human yeah. brain. In order okay, to I'll, I'll grant you that because human memory is not all that uh, granular anyway. It's pretty fuzzy. Um, but is that you? Okay, so here's my thought experiment. We slide you, Nick Bostrom, into a uh, functional MRI. We scan your connectome. We upload the digital file into the cloud, and I have it here on my phone, and I go, Nick, you're up here now. And you're sitting there going, no, I'm not. I'm right here. Yeah. And so are you saying that there's we have to redefine the self? There's just multiple Nick Bostroms, and each of them uh, thinks that they're the real one? Well, I think there are like two notions of the concept, uh, like two notions of self that that can come up, that 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 kind of always coincide in in our normal human experience, but that would come apart in some of these technological scenarios. And and philosophers have realized this. Like Derek Parfit, uh, who was my colleague at Oxford, mm -hmm. was famous for exploring uh, the difference between preservation of personal identity and survival in these thought experiments where you have like duplication, where you imagine a person being duplicated or teleported and the original survives. But Parfit argued that in those cases, the original person has survived, but uh, that uh, the personal identity is, is, is separate from this because the, per the original person can't be identical 
to any one of them um, because they are not identical to each other and the claim would be equal. And so, uh, so you, you would have like, even if the personal identity is not preserved, you could have survival. And anyway, that, that gets into these kind of philosophical issues. But, but I think certainly in some scenarios, I think your personal identity would be survive, uh, preserved in an uploading scenario. In, like if, if there was only one successor, it would be you, I think. If there were multiple copies made simultaneously, like equally branching out from the root node, I think it would be natural to say that you survived, but I'm not sure what to say about your personal identity in that case. I think just our concept of identity was like not really developed to deal with these cases. So it's a little bit sort of inconsistent when applied in these extreme uh, or like exotic uh, situations. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I I wrote about this in Heavens on Earth when I was looking at b both scientific and religious versions of the afterlife. And there's this idea that there's the mem self and the point of view self, peel of view self. So the memory self, this is the connectum. Just copy your 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 memory, uh, all your memories, and let's say we can do it. Um, but that's just a snapshot. I mean, if you did it when I was 30, and now I'm about to turn 70 this year, well, if, I, if you did it when I was 30, where, where's all the 40 years plus memories they they they're not part of that self that's some that's somebody else that's not me me is my point of view looking through my eyes from moment to moment to moment for all 69 and a half mm -hmm. years that I am now that's me and there is no fixed there's no fixed point where you go that's you right there at 40 or 50 or or, or whatever i don't yeah. see how that could ever be replicated cuz there's no snapshot there's no thing called the self in, in a fixed sense yeah, I think, I think there are several different notions. And like, you could ask somebody like, are you the same person now as you were when you were five? Of course not, yeah. yeah. And people are confused because like in, in one sense, clearly not. In, in another sense, clearly, yes, I'm still Nick Bostrom and like there's a continuous path. But so I think it's just that instead of having one concept of self, we have several different ones that normally in everyday use kind of coincide and tracks the same thing. But in these scenarios, um, they, they come apart. And so we need to sort of start to differentiate different. Yes, you would be the same person in sense one of being the same person, but like a different person in the sense two of being it. And, um, and I, I think more generally in this kind of world where we have like digital minds, I think there are a lot of new concepts that we would need to develop to sort of describe the ways that different minds could be related. Like, so humans are kind of, discrete things like here's one human here's another human uh like with digital minds you could imagine them being kind of partially overlapping or like briefly diverging and then converging um you could imagine all kinds of ways in which digital minds could uh vary that they're not possible for human minds to marry you can pause them speed them up slow them down um and that, that might be like a bunch of different slightly separate minds that sort of have some shared convergence point where they send information and it's not clear whether they are all one mind or several minds or like so there's like i think we will we, we don't yet have all the relevant concept for making sense of that kind of post-human reality but uh you know hopefully we'll have an opportunity to develop some of those as we uh, are you familiar with um both. are you familiar with frank tipler's book the physics of immortality yeah, he's a physicist. But it was a very long time since uh, I. Uh, yeah, that was ninety six. So here's his calculation. That, so he's projecting an omega point uh, computer in the far future that he calls God, essentially, uh, that will contain ten to the power of ten to the power of one hundred twenty three bits. That's a one followed by ten to the one hundred twenty three zeros. Powerful enough, he says, to resurrect everyone who ever lived. Um, that may be, but it's a staggeringly large number. But is even an Omega Point computer powerful enough to reconstruct all of the historical contingencies, all parts of life? You know, every interaction I ever had with everybody else, including like you right now, this particular moment instead of yesterday or whatever. I mean, how would how would any civilization create a computer powerful enough to do that? And Frank says, not only that, you'd have to re you'd have to resurrect everyone who ever could have lived. Because you, you you don't know who you just it's just your point of view self yeah, every one of them of, there's a lot of those that's people that's a that's a big cohort yeah yeah and um, if there was yeah. a computer powerful enough to do that wouldn't it have 
to consume so much energy, we could detect like a techno signature, uh, detect something like a Dyson sphere that has to capture all the energy of a sun to run such a computer. Yeah, well, um, so with Tipler, like, so one problem with his theories, I think at the time he thought it, and it was like an open possibility in cosmology that we would have like a big crunch that the universe yes, would kind right, of collapse yeah. Yeah. back onto itself into a singularity. And that's, uh, that's how his speculation was that in the, the final moments of that collapse, you could get this like super amount of computation done somehow. Um, now it yeah. looks instead like we are sort of gliding apart with a positive cosmological constant and it like it it looks like it's sort of a big whimper rather than a big yeah reverse big bang right so um so that that's one like now i mean in terms of um, reconstructing people uh later in simulation if if you haven't say chronically preserved their brains or something um i think um i mean certainly like Creating, recreating everybody who, who who could have lived like that's that's like a kind of a super astronomical number. Um, it depends a lot on how finally you individuate a person from like another very similar person. Like at what point are you close enough to basically say, yeah, that's kind of you know that's Michael Shermer, um, even if like. Your, your replication, like, oh, I, I like it got a few memories slightly rough and uh, like, you know, there's like a few details that, the, but it's, it's like captures the essence of him close enough that we can say that. It, so th that's like more like a philosophical parameter you would have to put in. Um, it's like an open question to what extent, if you imagine sort of arbitrarily powerful super intelligence, um, how close could it get to recreating a, a human mind, assuming they are like dead and decayed by the time, just from a behavioral traces, like like their writings or photos that their friends took, you know, on the holiday or like whatever other like information traces. Um, like if you if you were like a super intelligence and you studied all of this material and compared it with other humans uh, information traces and maybe some brains that you have access to and you sort of made the best possible inference, taking all of this information into account. And you tried to create like something that was as good an approximation as you thought. Like, how, how close would that approximation be to the real Michael Shermer? It's an open question, which is quite hard to really get a good grip on. Um, and certainly I think it would have to be close enough that like your friends couldn't tell a difference. Like if, if your friends still survive at this point, for example, Oh, your, your your kids or whatever. Like if if they if are my around, wife doesn't super know. Talented. Sorry, <laughs> if my wife doesn't know, <laughs> she can't tell. <laughs> yeah, so it's not like if 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 it, if, so, if if some replica was created that was like close enough to you in its qualitative behavior to sort of trick everybody you know, including like your your spouse and kids and parents. Like, would would that be close enough? I mean, I, I mean, at some point it just depends on your value system. Like how close does it have to be for you to care enough about it as if it were a perfect replica? Um, it might not be a factual question so much as a value question. Like how similar does an entity existing tomorrow have to be to me now for me to care about it in, in this kind of self-interested prudential way that I normally care about the person waking up in my bed tomorrow that's me like um like if 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 i if i knew that i was just going to be transformed overnight into a dragon that remembered nothing of my past life and shared none of my current interests and but made out of the same atoms like i i probably wouldn't really care that much about that dragon or at least not more than i care about any other living sentient being out there because it would be not in any meaningful sense me even if it like consisted of my atoms, maybe because it ate me during the night or something like that. But uh, oh, as, like, as, uh, so Kafka's, point, uh, like Kafka's metamorphosis, where you you know wake up as a cockroach or whatever. But the the problem with that is yeah. the, the 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 human mind is still in the other being. That wouldn't happen, right? If there was a true transformation. So let me just hit a couple more big topics here before I let you go. So the other the other minds problem the hard problem of consciousness how do you how would we ever know if an AI was sentient and conscious if we don't even know that you and I are 
Yeah, well, yeah, and maybe this might have to be our last uh, last topic. So that that's a big and practically relevant question now. I think we are starting to have AI systems that are not where it's no longer ridiculous to imagine that there could be some form of uh, um, conscious experience happening inside them. Uh, if if we look at the number of parameters and their behavior, it certainly seems to match some non-human animals uh, like in that we think are probably conscious and so yeah um this is a very difficult problem i think there are different approaches you could take um you could uh try to take some current theories of consciousness off the shelf uh, and try to just apply them to the case of ais so we have for example uh, global workspace theories is one theory of what creates conscious experience like that have been proposed and it's the idea that the things we are conscious of are ones that are sort of entered into a cognitive workspace from which different other more specialized cognitive models can sort of read and write but the thing in the shared workspace is kind of accessible to all the different parts of our brain um, there's like another theory attention schema theory which says conscious experiences are sort of um uh, arise in our in, in the modeling of our own attention mechanism. So we have like a little part of our brain that keeps track of what we are likely to be paying attention to. And that and, and there are like a few of those. You could like apply those to, to AIs. And uh, um, if you do that, it basically looks like either some AIs are conscious or that it would be relatively easy to build an AI that is conscious using current technology. Like if you just put together all the pieces into one system that just checked all these boxes. Um, you could um, as, uh, you could try to. I mean, you could ask. You could ask an AI. Uh, you could like that's how you would like with humans. Like if I want to know what you are feeling or thinking, like I the, the most is that? I, I wouldn't. I could try to put you in a big fMRI scanner or something like that. <laughs> but realistically, I would be much better off just asking you, right? Mm -hmm. And you could tell me. And so now we have AIs that can speak. It's a very natural thought to say, well, let, let's ask them. Um, and I think that might become a useful technique, but with some important provisos, which is that um, it wouldn't give us any information if you deliberately trained the AI to give you a predefined answer. So it's very easy right now when you fine tune an AI to sort of train it to like, when asked if you're conscious, deny it. Uh, or, or conversely, you could train an AI to like, affirm it. So, so if, if you want to use this to get any possibly relevant information about the question, you would first of all have to refrain from deliberately biasing the AI during training. Um, mm. Then there are other things you could do. You could try to detect if there are um, multiple modes of cognitive operation in an AI system. Like basically, you could try to find um, interpretability methods that allow you to differentiate when it is trying to say true things versus when it is just kind of rehashing things that it uh, remembers or trying to be entertaining or stuff like that. We, like th this goes back to the problem of hallucination that, that you brought up earlier with some current AI systems. So there's like preliminary research that suggests that you can like sometimes track when the AI is lying versus when it is trying to tell the truth based on different neural activation patterns. So you could then see, if you combine that with the self-report, you could see that when, when it says I'm conscious or when it denies it, does that statement occurs in, in, in a mode of operation where it looks like it is trying to say true things? Is it like the same kind of mm. thinking that it uses to try to factually answer other questions? Interesting. You could see if it is able to uh, say a lot of other things about its internal states that are not really about consciousness, but like whether are you currently... Um, aware like are, are you currently paying attention to x y or z what are your like ask it other things about its capabilities to check whether it has like the the ability to introspect that that could give you a little mm. hint maybe um and so there are some other ideas like that that they're still very kind of premature but um there's an interest now among some of these people and including to some extent some of the people working in frontier labs to try to figure out because you know, at, at some point we need to figure this out from a moral point of view. Like if we are building sentient creatures, like at some point yeah. it becomes really important that we treat them right and stuff. Is the next rights um, revolution for AI? 
Yeah, yeah. And I'm getting that, like, getting a good sort of happy cooperative relationship going uh, is really important, I think, because it might well be that in the future, most minds will be digital. And so, like, making sure the future goes well, not just for us, but for them too, I mm-hmm. think, is a key design criteria of anything that would be able to qualify for the name of Deep Utopia. All right, Deep Utopia, there it is. Get the book, read it. It's filled with pretty much every single biggest question you could ask about humanity <laughs> for our future is right there. <laughs> Thanks, Nick. We'll have you on uh, back after the singularity happens. <laughs> That'll be your next book. Yeah, fun chatting. <laughs>